Welcome to the Reality Revolution. Today, we are going to discuss the ancient secret of the power of thought. So far in an ongoing series on the channel, we are uncovering ancient secrets to a variety of powerful spiritual philosophies. And today, we're going to the very core of it all, the power of thought. These teachings uncover Rosicrucian techniques, ideas, and philosophies that have been gathered over many millennia. The Rosicrucian teachings have been amazing in my own life. And what is really amazing is the ways in which the Rosicrucians have gathered and collected so much amazing occult and secret knowledge over thousands of years, over many millennia. They have tested these philosophies and ideas and have gathered together specific techniques that are applicable in your own life. While you may have heard some of these ideas and techniques, the Rosicrucian teaching is a little bit different. They use a little bit different language. They call to the cosmic, for instance. But I find these particular chapters to be incredibly profound and powerful. The core of this podcast is really about the power of thought, the ways in which your mind and your thoughts can create your own reality. And so for us to learn the ancient secrets is very important because they have been using the power of thought to create realities since the beginning of time. So today we will discuss the ancient secrets of the power of thought as it has been taught by the Rosicrucians. The power of thought, the first steps to control of your destiny. When we are born, our physical brain is a blank, a page with nothing written upon it. Naked and alone we come into exile, into the unspeakable and incommunicable prison of this earth, said Thomas Wolfe. He understood and described in colorful language the problem each of us faces at birth. Everything must be learned. Everything is new. The infant has no skills, no trained brain cells, no thought and motion sequences to depend upon. It is capable only of those primitive reflex actions that are controlled by the lower part of the brain. Crying when in pain or distress, smiling and gurgling when pleased, as the child develops the upper part of the brain, which was blank at birth, begins to record, retain, and correlate the observations of the senses. This is not unlike the programming of one of our modern computers. The muscles learn by trial and error to adjust to various requirements, and a whole series of motion sequences is installed, ready to be called upon when needed. The eye of the newborn has no perception of depth or distance. This must be learned by correlating vision with touch. The child must find out just how far and how fast to extend its arms in order to pick up a glass from the table. Then, the restraining muscles which slow down the movement at the right distance must be taught or the glass will be knocked over. Also, the proper tension of the fingers must be learned or the glass will fall. All these and a thousand other highly complex movements must be programmed into the new brain. This is a slow process which must be learned for each type of muscular action and it takes a long time, usually several years, before the growing child can demonstrate satisfactory control. Physical competence is of course only the beginning. Next should come the disciplining of the emotions and the mind. But unfortunately, most modern educators fail to accord this the importance it merits. True home training and the need to get along in school and in business impose certain restraints but no one today attains anything approaching the same control over emotions and mind that they display in the physical areas. This glaring human deficiency is at the heart of most of the present unrest, conflict, and political disturbance. How can one presume to direct events when his own emotions and thoughts are permitted to run wild? Have you thought of this? A person with an affliction like cerebral palsy is pitied for his obvious lack of physical control 
and one who lazily or through ignorance fails to develop elementary physical skills is an object of contempt. Should not similar value be placed upon emotional and mental discipline? The Rosicrucians believe so, and their training program, which is given here in capsule form, is designed to help you gain this control. They recommend that one proceed step by step, in an orderly fashion, not too unlike the gradual learning process of the small child. The process is similar to the motion sequences established in the brain of the child must be built into the mind by thought. Thought is the greatest energy. It has been stated often, and quite truly, that thought is the greatest energy. History relates again and again how the destiny of mankind has been altered by new ideas, by the powerful thoughts of original thinkers. The vision of a united world led Alexander, Caesar, Genghis Khan, Napoleon, and more recently Hitler into their wars of conquest, a great idea badly carried out. The vision still persists and probably will become eventually the guiding influence in the creation of world peace, but via a voluntary instrument like the United Nations, rather than a forced submission. It is clear also that the scientific progress of our world with its luxuries and comforts is the result of thought. The remarkable achievements of cooperative effort evidenced in the efficiency of our great industrial and commercial complexes are due to the creative thinking of the men who planned these companies. Miracles can be accomplished by the energy of thought. Yes, no one will deny that thought is powerful, and most will admit it is the most powerful energy available to man. For this reason, it is easy to accept as true a statement that miracles can be accomplished by thought. That thought can change your life, bring you wealth, comfort, security, whatever you need and want, and it can, if you know how to think. Many students become confused and discouraged when they try to use the energy of thought and fail to attain the desired objective. They may read or be told, concentrate upon success, visualize yourself enjoying the success you desire. Or again, in another vein, raise your consciousness to God and you will find peace and happiness. These admonitions are sound and true, but for the average person, they are equivalent to having someone point to a piano and say, play Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto and it will calm your nerves. This may be good advice, but all three of these injunctions presume a training and skill which few possess, and therefore it is not surprising that most of us fail when we try to do as they suggest. In order to employ the power of thought, it is necessary to start from the beginning and learn to use your mind and brain in almost the same way the infant achieves control of his muscles. The child learns automatically driven by its needs and desires. You must consciously train yourself, a more difficult task because it requires the use of the will, the powers of observation. In the Rosicrucian technique, one starts by training the powers of observation. This method was used and recommended by Gautama Buddha as an initial step in training the mind. He would walk among his students while lecturing them, then suddenly stop and ask, where was I standing when I uttered the word faith? Or at another time, he would pause in his instruction and say, what movements did I make with my right hand when I spoke of beauty? Thus he taught his pupils attentiveness and trained their powers of observation. Here are three exercises designed as initial steps in learning to use your mind. They are quite simple. So simple you may think to yourself, how can this help me? Do not discount them. Your mind has a vast potential and until you learn to tap this tremendous reservoir of power, you will not realize to even a small degree on your capabilities. These exercises are the first step. They are designed to help you learn to take hold of a thought. Practice each one of them at least once a day from now on. It will be no hardship. They take but a few seconds, and before long they will become almost habitual. Here are the exercises. You can see how simple they are. 1. When you go into a room for the first time, shut your eyes for a second and see how many objects in the room you can name. Table, chairs, pictures, ashtrays, desks, whatever you can recall. Do this whenever you enter a room or any place new to you. 2. 
after ascending or descending a flight of steps, recall how many there were. 3. This is to be done in the evening only. Recall what you did when you first left the house this morning, or if you did not leave, what you did after breakfast. What did you see? What did you do? Recall about three or four minutes of this activity, no more. The next day, recall what you did after lunch or in any other three-minute interval of your day. After two or three weeks' daily practice of the foregoing, you will begin to grasp their purpose and probably will design some similar exercises of your own. As you notice, the third exercise is slightly different from the others and is a step into a higher area of training. As I've said, don't let the obvious simplicity of these formula deceive you. Don't underrate them. They provide an essential preliminary training without which no sound mental control can be developed. The powers of concentration. The next step toward mind control is training in concentration. Just as I am sure many of you said to yourselves, I don't need these exercises in observation. My powers of observing are already well enough developed. So I am sure a certain number of you will say, I don't need to learn to concentrate. I can concentrate just fine on anything I want. My whole business or my whole life demands concentration and I've had to learn this. You will get no argument from me on your abilities. You may have the keen, highly trained observation powers of a big city detective, or you may possess the ability to concentrate of an atomic scientist. But you miss the point. The purpose of these exercises is to teach you how to lay hold on thought, how to find the handle, as the baseball players say. They differ from the normal everyday type of observation and concentration in that they are conscious, deliberate acts of the will and not the automatic result of a compelling need. There is a difference between emotionally motivated thought and thoughtfully motivated emotion, which I will discuss later in this chapter. But now here are some exercises in concentration. These should be performed at least once each day, and you can start them the same day you start the observation exercises. You can employ them concurrently or not, as you see fit. 1. Multiply two numbers of two digits each, such as 26 and 39, in your head, not with pencil and paper. Do this until you are sure your answer is correct. Then do the same with two numbers of three digits each, as 413 times 765. Do this once each day with different numbers. 2. Memorize four lines of a poem, any poem, long or short, do this once a day. These exercises need not go on forever but they should continue until you begin to understand what is meant by taking hold of thought. 3. When passing people in the street or any other place where you can see a person for a short time and then have him pass out of your field of vision, select one person and look closely into his face. Then look away and for one minute or more hold that face, a picture of it, in your mind's eye. Study its expression. Seek to understand its owner. As you realize, exercise number three is different from one and two, and you are correct in assuming it is designed to lead you a step beyond what you now know and understand. A conscientious practice of this exercise will be found very rewarding. Without any special effort on your part, you will find that you are developing a capacity for attuning with the people whose faces you hold before you. You will become aware of their dominant emotions very often fear, because today many people are fear-ridden, less often pity or compassion, sometimes joy, sometimes anger. If you are sensitive and pursue this practice for a longer period, you will gradually become aware of their thoughts, or better, their thought forms. Your conscious application to these exercises puts your brain to work in such a simple way that you can observe it working. Then, by observation of your brain at work, you will gradually come to an apprehension of thought. Thought is an activity of your mind, and the mind can function apart from the brain. Thus, it is possible to think apart from the brain, and certain people have trained themselves to do this. But the average person is trained from birth to recognize only those impacts upon his consciousness that come via the physical senses and record themselves on his brain. Thus, all scientific thought, deductions based upon physical observations, and all reasoning are done through the brain. Almost all of the memory records you use are stored in brain tissue. 
your mind keeps a much better memory storehouse than the brain. But because we lean so heavily on the brain, we seldom reach into the mind to recall an incident from the past. We are all so dependent on the brain that even abstractions like love, hate, fear, patriotism, and generic ideas like dog, horse, house, and farm, which are clearly super physical and therefore belong in the realm of the mind, even they register or employ a corresponding image in the brain or in that inner screen of the brain sometimes called the phantasm, the powers of meditation. If you want to use thought to its full potential, if you want to employ the great power of thought, you must learn to think consciously apart from the brain. The brain is a wonderful and most useful tool, but for most creative work, creation of the highest order, the brain is like a straitjacket which restricts, binds, and limits the action of the mind. So it is necessary to go on to another group of exercises designed to aid you in your effort to employ thought consciously and with purpose. These are exercises in meditation. As you undoubtedly realize, Concentration Exercise 3 is partly meditative in character. There are many meditation techniques which differ one from the other according to need and purpose. Here we will give three exercises, all aimed at the same objective, to train you to apprehend and employ thought. 1. Find a place where you will be free from interruption for five minutes. Seat yourself in a straight back chair with your feet touching but not crossed. Allow your hands to rest easily in your lap and sit relaxed but with your back straight and your head erect. Breathe easily and naturally. Close your eyes and think of the color blue. Any shade of blue from the pale blue which is nearly white all the way down to the scale to the deep purple. Think of just one shade in any one meditative period. See it all around you. See it fill the entire room. Do not dwell on this for more than one minute, but at the same time, do not let your mind wander. This will require an effort of the will, and you may not entirely be successful at first, but keep trying and you will be. When the minute approximately is up, Spend the next minute thinking of pink and the third minute in the same manner thinking of pure white. The white of new fallen snow in the sunshine, a crystalline brilliance. Spend not more than three minutes in all, then rise, take a deep breath and relax, then proceed to the next meditation. 2. Resume the same position as in exercise 1 and with your eyes closed think of a sound. Think of a violin playing, playing any selection familiar to you. But it must be a violin, not voice or another musical instrument. If an orchestration should swell up around the key sound, separate it out until you hear only the clear note of the violin. One minute only. For the next minute, hear a horn or a reed instrument like a saxophone, either one. But remember, hear only that one instrument and shut out all the other sound. For the third minute, hear in your mind a piano playing a piece of music familiar to you. This is more difficult because instead of single notes there will be chords and complex combinations. Carry it for a minute, not more than shut it out, rise, take a deep breath and relax. As you can observe, these are training exercises. They parallel in the area of the mind the simple movements of the infant who is exploring the physical world for the first time. These are your initial endeavors to experiment with the mental world. To perform them perfectly is at first impossible. You will make many errors. You won't be able to carry the violin or piano clearly, and other sounds will intrude well before the full minute has been completed. The colors will become confused, and you will have a veritable rainbow at one time and no color at all at another. But gradually, by trying and keeping at it, you will gain more and more. The third exercise is of a different type. In one and two you heard sounds and saw colors, and your will was brought into play only in order to keep your attention upon the desired objective and to shut out disturbance. In this, the third exercise, you are to use your will in a different way. So sit as before, and when you have relaxed with your eyes closed, see the color pink all around you. See a clear light pink, not a fabric pink, but pink as in a ray of light. It is important to see this not only in front and to the sides, but also in back, above, below, and all around you. See yourself entirely enveloped 
in a pink cloud which extends 6 to 10 inches out from you in all directions. Hold this image for one full minute, then dismiss it from your mind, rise, take a deep breath, and relax. These are basic exercises, each one slightly different. Many variations exist. There are probably hundreds. As you progress, you will catch the tone of each exercise and be able to design variations of your own. But for the present, follow the outline given. Remember, in the world of the mind, you are like a baby learning to walk or learning to hold things. Just as the infant programs into his consciousness the right muscular action to use when picking up a spoon, so you must learn the delicate control necessary to bring a thought form into physical manifestation. At this point, I want to reveal to you a little known but very important fact. The mind is the kingly part of each one of us. It is designed by nature and the power it can wield to be the ruler of our lives and to control all the events in them. Yet most of us employ it as a servant. We make the mind the slave of our appetites and emotions. The mind accepts this indignity with considerable reluctance. It registers subtle complaints, but with our customary lack of awareness, we don't notice them, and we completely fail to understand its more vigorous protests, which often take the form of illness and disaster. No wonder our attempts to use the power of the mind usually end in failure. For the purposes of analysis, we have been describing human nature as having three parts. The physical, emotional, and mental. Actually, no separation or division exists. They are all you. Normally, you think of the physical body as I. This is the visible collection of cells and molecules known as John Smith or Sally Jones. It eats and breathes to keep its life and rests when it is tired. Its basic functions are mostly automatic and were designed by an intelligence far above and beyond our creative abilities. These physical bodies are most remarkable instruments. They have ability to repair themselves and if allowed to function uninterruptedly in the smooth automatic manner in which they were designed, they would probably last forever or at least as long as we wanted to use them. But humanity, and this means all of us, has developed certain habits of action and emotion and thought that interfere with the normal functioning of the physical equipment and cause it damage. Today, most intelligent and well-educated people control their physical impulses very well. We are beginning to learn the art of self-restraint, but unfortunately our emotional natures are still dominant, and in spite of our good intentions and best efforts, the emotional nature takes control and orders the complete man around. The great fear so rampant in the world and in our present day, the greatest sin, is probably fear. In fact, nearly everyone, fear like several other basic emotions, is an incentive to action, a powerful incentive to physical action. Originally, it was implanted for a good purpose. When fear was experienced and primitive man only felt fear when confronted by danger, Adrenaline was released immediately into his bloodstream in order to stimulate his heart action and give him a rapid increase in strength and energy with which to meet the threat. Today we experience fear quite often when there is no danger present. Since the body does not analyze, it releases the adrenaline to provide strength and energy, which is then not used. This leaves a residue which becomes a poison in the bloodstream and eventually breaks down the physical structure. One way in which a destructive emotion can cause actual physical damage. There are countless others, it can be said without fear of contradiction, that all violent emotions leave harmful physical effects in their wake. To live on the emotional level, and most people today do live on the emotional level, to permit our emotions to control our actions seriously hampers the functioning of our minds. The emotions were designed as tools to be used as incentives to action. We mistakenly let them rule us. If you would change this pattern, if you would improve your life and create a future near your heart's desire, take the first step upward. Learn how to think. Learn how to let your mind direct your life and display the authority of your emotions. Those who have tried this know it to be more difficult than it sounds. Yet, it is not so difficult but that everyone who reads this may accomplish it. Determination, will, and work are required, and the place to begin is 
with the simple exercises given earlier in this chapter. These will lead you step by step in a most gentle fashion away from emotional control and bring your mind into the dominant position for which it was designed. Let me make some points clear. Your physical appetites are not to be blocked out. They must not be negated. That is the way of suppression which always ends in an explosion. Control and guidance form the proper technique by means of which the physical impulse is redirected, rechanneled, and not suppressed. For example, if you have a craving for a rich dessert, which you know is not good for you, it is better to take something like fruit than nothing at all. In this way, the craving is not denied, merely redirected to a better food. Some teachers recommend that you will kill out desire. This does not mean you should eliminate and destroy your emotions. You would only be half human if you did. Again, the best technique is redirection. Each emotion is dual in nature. It has higher and lower counterparts. You should strive to channel all your emotional drives into the higher counterparts. For example, we are told that love is the highest emotion of which we are capable, yet it has lower and higher counterparts, love of self as opposed to love of others. Brought to its highest, love of others becomes love of all men, nay, love of all that lives and breathes. As another example, fear is most destructive and must be replaced with trust and confidence. The higher counterparts are creative and will bring to you the strength and the benefits that you need. Each emotion should be examined, not taken for granted. If you are manifesting the lower counterpart, try to change it to its higher form. It is unwise to attack the emotions directly. By doing so, you focus your attention upon your desires, and in this way they are actually strengthened, for energy follows thought. It is much better to approach the problem, as has been suggested, by taking steps to develop an awareness of and an interest in your mind. As you become more and more preoccupied with your mental processes, your physical appetites and lower emotions will gradually lose their dominance over you until you are ultimately able to free the power of thought. Therefore, do not regard the exercises suggested here as trivial. They are simple, yes, but they are the first steps on the highway which leads to the control of your destiny. Controlling Mental and Psychic Energy For those who would learn to employ the power of the mind, the injunction is given, seek, find, and follow a pure line of thought. The Hindu scriptures call this one-pointed thought. As you are aware, the word pure is here, used not as the opposite of unclean. It has no reference to morals or sin, but the sense of uncluttered thought. A great teacher has said, achievement is impeded primarily not so much by doubt, as by inquit thoughts generated by old habits. The desire for mental power should be as an arrow fitted to a bow. It must be launched with a mighty effort, and the aim at the desired target must be perfect. But even after a successful launching, it may sometimes be deflected by unexpected obstacles. Thought is the arrow, and every thought is potentially creative. Select the best targets, and may your arrows reach their marks. When man came into being on this planet, he found he was in an environment that supplied all his needs. Some of the South Sea Islands exemplify this. The climate was mild, the air clear, the sun warm. No clothes were required and there was an abundance of fresh water and food to be had just by picking it from a tree. This ideal environment is symbolized for us in the Bible story of the Garden of Eden. Man had all he needed. No work was necessary and his every wish appeared to be granted even before he expressed it. This was and is a product of the thought of a great being. But man is also a thinker. Man possesses the unique ability to create by thought. So eventually certain more advanced men discovered they could change this environment and change it they did, but not always for the best. These first improvements were extremely simple, but from modest beginnings, which probably extended over a million years grew the desire of man to better himself and his surroundings. At first, his endeavors were only physical, and to the present day, this is the area that commands most attention. But now, there are some who see the need not only to improve their environment, but also their reaction to this environment. It is with these relatively few struggling souls that man's best future lies. Dimly recalling past glory, man tries to command the elements to bend them to his will but only partly succeeds. Sometimes even his successes are failures in the larger sense. 
and that they result in distortions and ugliness. Much of what man has created has little real value, and some is even harmful. Only a scattered few over the centuries have actually sought to create evil, but many men have blindly bought into being creations that destroyed themselves and hurt others. This is symbolized in the story of Frankenstein. Nearly everyone wants good for himself and for others, yet in their blindness, many forge evil. They seek what they imagine to be good, but through selfishness or fear or pride, they strike out and hurt others. This is the worst sin to hurt another. And it is the reason why all esoteric and religious teachings tell us, seek to heal, not hurt. This is mentioned at the very beginning of the instruction on the use of mental power in order that you may understand and be warned that selfish use of mental power can be dangerous to others and is always dangerous to oneself. This is not meant to imply you should not use your mind to obtain certain material benefits. On the contrary, this is exactly what mental power is designed for, the control of one's environment. But there is a right and a wrong way, and the wrong way is to advance yourself at the expense or damage to another. Actually, it is easier to create new things, new wealth, than to compete with others for something that already exists. There is so much richness available to you, waiting just to be tapped by your mind, that it is wasteful of your energy to struggle for an area of wealth already claimed or sought for by another. If you must have what someone else desires or already possesses, there is something wrong with your own emotional structure which I seriously urge you to repair. Learning True Thought Control As the first step in learning thought control, you should examine the thinking process and try to understand what takes place. This is possible because we have all built into us a unique ability. We can think and we can also examine ourselves and our thinking process while we are thinking. Actually, we are thinking all the time, certainly every waking moment, but we do not often notice it. We take it for granted, much as we do our breathing and digestive processes. Thoughts flow continuously through our minds, and these thoughts, by their very nature, are creative. They make us what we are, and they create our environment. The world about us, the things that happen to us, for everything we see, everything we hear, Everything that we become aware of through any of our senses first existed as a thought in the mind of a thinking being. This statement is not easy to prove. Like many others, which are not immediately evident, proof of their truth lies mainly in the doing. For example, an accomplished pianist may say that Tchaikovsky's first piano concerto is more difficult to play than a Chopin waltz. And the average person will accept this statement because he has no way of determining whether it is so or not. Only by learning and playing both compositions can one prove it out for oneself. Most of us will accept the musician's word. He is the expert. In the same way we accept the statement of an advanced being that thought is all pervasive and all creative as far as our world is concerned. A student once asked his teacher about this. He wanted to know why a physical world was necessary if thought is all creative and all pervasive. He didn't ask the question in just that way, but phrased it as you may have put it more than once. He asked, why was I born? Why do I exist as a physical being? His teacher, who was a great sage, replied, in order that you may be trained to think properly, and proceeded to explain, in the thought world there is no perceptible time interval between the initiating thought and the creation of the thought form. To human awareness, they are simultaneous. For this reason, all untrained, and poorly disciplined beings, such as we humans are, find it impossible to distinguish between cause and effect in the mental world. But in the physical world, where all vibrations are much slower, there is always a perceptible time lag between the initiating thought and physical manifestation. Sometimes, as in the case of human action, the interval may be short seconds only, but as a rule, it is much longer. When a change in the established physical world is required, it may take 10 days, months, or even years. This time lag gives our slow observation the opportunity to detect and distinguish between cause and effect. This is why we live in the physical. The interval between mental cause and physical effect can be observed by everyone, but the connection or relation between the two is not always evident. Thus part of our training is to seek out causes. Do not take things for granted, for everything has a cause, sometimes immediate, sometimes remote. Start with obvious relationships such as that 
when you put your finger in a flame, the heat will cause pain. Or when you put a towel in a pail of water, it will come out wet. Then move on to more subtle connections such as the causes of a riot. Here we may find that because the night was too hot for staying indoors, there were many people on the street with nothing to do. Also, the prolonged heat spell had made them all irritable. Third, there had been a man haranguing them about how unfortunate they were and how many injustices had been heaped upon them and way down near the bottom in importance on the list of causes, there is an actual incident that precipitated the riot. You can and should seek out and analyze three or four incidents in the paper each day. You won't always be right in your assessment of causes because your information may be incomplete or the news story written with a bias, but it will give you the necessary training. Much more difficult is to discover the causes of your own actions. We always like to appear in a good light to ourselves and this leads us to conceal from ourselves the true causes of many of the things we do. Whenever we inwardly regard a cause as unworthy of the image we have of ourselves, we bury it deep in the subconscious and give ourselves some superficial but more acceptable reason for our behavior. If you persevere in your study of yourself, and you should, you probably won't like what you find. No one does. But the discoveries you make and the adjustments you apply will make you a better person, a happier person, and a more successful person. Thought Radiation Now let us proceed with our study of thought. Each thought at its inception produces a dual effect. First, there is a vibratory wave, a radiation from the center, not unlike the radiation of a radio wave from a broadcasting tower. This wave moves outward equally in all directions with gradually diminishing intensity, which varies with the distance. It continues to emanate from the mind of the thinker as long as the thought is held, but it ceases instantly when the thinking changes or stops. Like all other vibrations, these mentally induced vibrations tend to reproduce themselves whenever the opportunity presents itself. You are familiar with the experiment in physics, in which a tuning fork is made to vibrate by striking its corresponding note on the piano. In this same manner, do these mental vibrations provoke in another mental body their own rate of motion. In other words, they tend to arouse in a receiving mind thoughts of the same type as those in the mind of the originating thinker. The distance to which such thought waves penetrate and their impact upon the minds of others depends upon the strength and clarity of the original thought. It is not unlike speech. Sound waves are created by the voice and radiate in all directions. The distance to which the voice will penetrate depends upon the power and clearness of the original enunciation. Also, hearing will not always mean understanding. In the same way, many thought vibrations impinge upon minds which fail to register them because they have no way to relate them to their current knowledge. Attention is also a factor. A man struggling to solve a business problem is not likely to register even the best mental message on an unrelated subject. But in general, a forceful thought will radiate farther than a weak and undecided one, and clear, well-defined thoughts penetrate better than those which are vague and confused. Generally, these thought radiations convey more the quality of the thought than its details. For example, if a highly developed and dedicated person were to enter a room full of people, the waves of thought and feeling which pour out from him would affect everyone present. But the response would not be the same in every case. Each would have this devotion and ideal stirred in a way most familiar to himself, and this would probably be different for everyone. The one thing in common would be the general raising of the vibratory nature. Everyone who thinks high thoughts pours out the kind of vibrations that tend to stimulate a similar level of thought in others. They act vigorously upon minds accustomed to high thought, but also affect to some degree every mind within the sphere of their radiation. This tends to awaken duller minds to higher possibilities and to stimulate those not ordinarily given to spiritual ideas so that everyone who thinks on a high plane is doing a form of missionary work even though he may not be aware of it. Thought forms. The second of the two effects of thought is the creation of a form. As has been pointed out, we move in a sea of energy, which is most responsive to thought. Every impulse sent out from the mind clothes itself immediately in a vehicle of this vitalized matter. Thus, the thought becomes for a time, long or short, a quasi-living creature, with the thought force acting as its soul and the vivified essence acting as its body. These strange forms exist on an emotional level as well as mental level, and some writers refer to them as elementals. 
If the thought is about someone else, the thought form or elemental moves to that other person and discharges its qualified energy upon his mental body. If the thought be about oneself, as the vast majority of the average person's thoughts are, then it hovers about ready to act upon its creator whenever he is in a relaxed or passive state. For example, a man fond of food may think about a sumptuous banquet topped off by rich desserts. While at work and concentrating on his job, he may forget all about this even though the thought forms he created are hanging over him like a cloud. But when he leaves his office and his attention is no longer concentrated on his work, the craving for food will strike him. He may think to himself that this is merely his appetite returning. But in this land of plenty, one almost never has time between meals to develop real hunger. In his case, the desire for food is but a reaction upon him of his own thought forms. This would be equally true of a person who harbored impure thoughts. And of course, it is true in a myriad of other ways. When the attention is otherwise engaged, the thought forms are held aside, submerged below the level of awareness. But as soon as the mind relaxes, they return and fill the conscious mind. A person with a religious background might describe this as being tempted by the devil. But actually, it is but his own thought creations that return and demand his attention and indulgence. Each person travels through life enclosed in a veritable cage of forms which he has created by his thoughts and desires. Through this opaque medium, he looks out at the world and quite naturally, everything he sees is colored and modified by the vibratory screen he has built. This is what is meant by St. Paul's statement, we see, but through a glass darkly. Until he achieves good control of thought and motion, he lives in a world of illusion where nothing is ever quite the way it seems to him. In addition to the influence it exerts on our actions, every thought form has a tendency to reproduce itself in the physical world as an action, an event, or a physical thing. A very weak and tenuous thought form will disintegrate long before this outpicturing can take place but one powerfully endowed will usually result in a physical manifestation in a relatively short time. The word usually is used here because there are many millions of thought forms being created every minute of the day and often certain ones are diametrically opposed to others. In this case, they effectively cancel each other out. It is fortunate for us that they do, for mankind does not, as a rule, create good thought forms. It has been said that when even the smallest thought enters Without opposition into the megaphone of space, it attracts to itself many locusts of the same kind, thus causing the smoky atmosphere of the planet. One can imagine the millions of low-grade thoughts moving like dark swarms of locusts over the face of the world and creating around it a murky and smoky atmosphere. Students frequently say, I don't see how this affects me. I don't see any murky atmosphere. The sun seems to shine brightly during the day and the stars are clear at night. It is difficult to grasp the concrete reality of thought. We are taught and trained in such a way that only the audible word is given importance. In our educational systems, there is no serious attempt made to study the power of thought. The feeble efforts of J.B. Ryan at Duke University and others like him have not been accorded scientific standing, and it will probably take some major move, such as interest by the government of a major power, before any real large-scale and productive research is undertaken. Therefore, surrounded by incredulity as we are, it is not surprising that we fail to apply this knowledge to our everyday lives. Thoughts are silent and invisible to most, and this creates the illusion they are ineffective and not important, but we should choose our thoughts as carefully as we choose our words, and not allow them to ramble aimlessly, creating we know not what kind of future for ourselves and others. Every thought tends to reproduce itself in physical form. For emphasis, let me repeat that every thought has a tendency to reproduce itself. Some thoughts are too weak, some too complicated to ever reach the physical stage, but a clear thought repeated again and again is almost certain to create a replica of itself sooner or later. Sometimes there is a long interval, but a clear, non-competitive thought well visualized and repeated often will always manifest physically. Let me tell you a true story which will make this clear. There was a young man who was out of work and needed a job badly. He heard of the power of thought and tried to employ it to create a position for himself in the business world. 
He had no idea what kind of opportunity would present itself. And since he didn't want to block out any possibilities, he confined his visualization to a picture of himself sitting in a private office. His office, just four walls, a window, and a small desk. But as the days and weeks went on and he continued this visualization faithfully every day, he kept adding to the picture. Gradually, it grew larger. Pictures appeared on the wall. The desk became one of carved wood instead of the simple metal one he had first conceived. As the office grew larger, his own ideas about it expanded and he thought, why not a closet where I could keep an extra suit in case I should have to stay in town for the evening? Then, having gone that far, he thought of a dressing room and a bath and a little annex to the office. He visualized bookshelves on the wall behind him and a large picture window off to his right. Thus, his visualization changed and expanded. He kept faithfully at his daily meditation and never despaired as the weeks went by. Eventually, little details started to creep into the picture, details which he had not intended to put there. For example, although he was in New York and expected to work there, he could see a palm tree swaying outside the window. It was about this time he got a job, a good job, with a simple office of just four walls and a metal desk. It was nothing like the picture he had seen toward the last, but it was a job and he was satisfied, so he gave up the visualization. But now comes a sequel. Fourteen years later, having become quite successful, he bought a home in Florida. It had a large living room with a picture window in it, and one day as he sat there before a carved desk which had come with the house, he idly gazed out of the window to his right, and suddenly a recollection struck him. It was the palm tree swaying outside the window that did it. This room in which he sat was a replica of the room he had visualized many years before. True, he had thought of it then as an office, not a living room, but the bookcases were there at his back. There was a dressing room and a bath directly off it, and a palm tree swaying in the breeze outside. I can vouch for the accuracy of this down to the last detail, because the man involved is myself. Bringing a thought into physical manifestation the most important factor in bringing a thought into physical manifestation is the clarity of the visualization that accompanies it. I must now assume you have been performing the training exercises given, another like them in which you have designed for yourself. After a few weeks of this discipline, you should begin to understand how to use your mind to continue the smile of a child learning to use its muscles. You will have passed the toddling stage and are ready to acquire some more sophisticated mental skills. Right here, I would like to pass on to you some practical suggestions which are offered by an advanced student. 1. Avoid chaotic thinking and try to think logically. People who think chaotically are like those who wave their hands in the dark, unaware of the objects they hit. Since we cannot avoid thinking, we should at least learn to think in an orderly manner. We are ourselves living thought and it is extremely difficult to control the incessant stream of material, the substance of our consciousness which flows from our minds into space. If we could, we would indeed be supermen, but let us do what we can. As soon as we are aware of the negative thought, push it out. Replace aimless thoughts with precise ones. Actually, they are less tiring. Each person being different from every other person should devise his own special pathway of logical thought. Two. Avoid untruthful or distorted thinking. How many secrets of bad luck can be explained by distorted thinking? Observe as far as you are able the consequences of untruthful or distorted thought, sometimes called prejudice. Cease jeopardizing your own future. Stop releasing dark, dangerous thoughts, for these come back to you like a boomerang in the form of bad luck. Here is much traveling dynamite that should be investigated both personally and also on a national scale. Of course, it is not easy to think straight. Most people are so crippled by their unconscious thought and prejudices that they don't know if they are thinking truthfully or not, and when things go wrong, they are not aware of the connection. 3. In addition to correction and counterbalance, adopt a positive attitude. A benediction sent into the world is the purest and finest form of thought energy. Your own projects can grow by benediction. Unfortunately, people are usually so beset by personal problems this seldom occurs to them. Their desires for advancement, better social position, and the approval of others dominate their thinking in a confused fashion. To ignore these tendencies is impossible. To try to rid one's self of them is futile. The best course is to try to steer them into better and higher courses, 
It is a question of direction. The same exterior influences may move you to the same old course of action, but when your aim is toward a higher objective, your action becomes a move in the right direction. No one becomes perfect overnight, and this does not mean you will no longer make mistakes, but as you become aware of the laws of energy and begin to handle the tools of thought with greater competence, you will find your whole life changing for the better. You will become happier, better adjusted, and more at peace with yourself and others as your power over your environment grows, and it surely will if you sincerely and faithfully follow the directions herein given. For now, this concludes the ancient secret of the power of thought. A lot of this is very important, especially in the process of reality creation. Understanding that thought is the greatest energy. It is very important this energy be understood in order for it to better your life. And you can do a lot with simple exercises that are given at the beginning of this, the Rosicrucian techniques of observation, learning how to observe a room, a situation that you're in, and then evolving your own powers of concentration by multiplying numbers in your head and memorizing passages of poems and walking by somebody on the street and remembering their face, among other exercises. There's obviously a lot of attention deficit disorder going around and we're constantly in a state of chaos because of our culture and our environment, our phones, take away our own powers of concentration. Also the power of meditation, learning to be in the moment and to exercise our mind, hearing sounds, seeing colors and using meditation to evolve this basic ability in our mind creates powerful thought energy and using this thought energy is very very critical once we learn this and we start to control our thoughts we can then get into a process where we create vibratory waves a radiation from our minds that creates vibratory correspondence in the environment around us we are given very good examples of this then in the process we create thought forms which almost always end up being out pictured in the world around us now of course I've talked about this hundreds of times on the channel and the podcast and some of this may seem somewhat repetitive but it is an ancient secret that the thought has great energy and many of us do not believe this and if you can focus your mind and learn the powers of concentration and meditation, you can bring your thoughts into manifestation. When you start to control your mind and you avoid chaotic thinking and avoiding untruthful or distorted thinking and you keep a positive attitude, when you focus on something and place your attention upon it, giving it that energy, amazing things will happen for you. This is the ancient secret the power of thought you can find all episodes of the reality revolution at therealityrevolution.com i'd love it if you checked out my art you can find it at www.newearth.art and welcome to the reality revolution